Yeah. Pretty good afternoon. Uh, and we'll begin right now. Let me just spend a minute or two introducing our, our guest speaker today, Dina Seidel, many of you know her, is currently a visiting scholar in our RU Cafe, that is the Rutgers Center for Agricultural Food Ecosystems. It's part of the IFNH. She's a science filmmaker expert with over 25 years experience making professional science films, beginning with films from the National Geographic, Discovery Channel and Science Time series for the New York T Times Television. She was co-producer and editor of two hours of ocean science documentation of Forbidden Deaths that was directed by Al Giddens. Many of you know her from the 10 years of working with her or know her work when she was at Rutgers in, in former positions with scientists at Rutgers producing more than a dozen professional science films with her film students in classes from Rutgers English Department and the Rutgers Film Bureau. Under Dina's leadership, um, Seidel has established creative and trusting science filmmaking partnerships with researchers across many disciplines, including marine and coastal sciences, departments of nutrition, ecology, natural resources, our own, my own plant biology. Seidel has led professional documentary film productions in Antarctica, Italy, several Pacific Island nations. You'll see some of those, I think, during today's talk. Through a personalized training and mentorship, Seidel has provided professional opportunities for her science communication students. Many of those were our, are our and were our Rutgers undergraduates. And they've been to as far away as Rome, Spain, Zambia, Thailand, Brazil, Virgin Islands, closer to home, Alabama, Nashville, as well as local in New Jersey, and have created compelling real world stories and earning professional credits as producers, that is the students as producers, directors, cinematographers, and editors. One of the students at a Rutgers undergraduate, Jean-Paul Isaac, um, I was involved with him for quite a long time. And he had actually received recognition as a young filmmaker that it was invited to go to Hollywood to present one of the film awards on stage during the Oscars. So the students have really have shown tremendous accomplishments from that mentoring. Rutgers original science films have been screened around the world on Netflix, on cable TV, and received international film festival awards and even had theatrical releases in movie theaters. The recognition though, which is why we wanted Dina to give this presentation today, the recognition for all of our science is invaluable to us, this, particularly these days, as it provides a unique opportunity to showcase our research to the public, to those in position of decision-making from environmental regulation, to public policy, to climate change, food security, and importantly, to generate and regain public trust in science. Today is our second and final semester for our RU Cafe. It's a pleasure that our center is joined by the Center for Childhood Nutrition Research that Dan Hoffman leads and the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Oscar Schofield Chairs. So we're pleased to have Dina come to us today to talk about Tell Your Science Story, empowering scientists to document and communicate their research. And most all of us note, but I'll ask everybody anyway to please mute yourselves during the presentation until you have questions. Okay, Dina, it's all yours. Jim, thank you so much. That was a very, uh, very generous introduction, really, really an honor. Um, and it's really very special for me to have prepared this presentation, especially with this distinguished audience in attendance, because we really designed this model that I'm gonna, I'm gonna share today together. It was something that we evolved together over many projects over many years. So, so that's really an honor. And please, I invite any and all of you to ask questions, to interrupt me, to correct me, to, to chime in, to add your thoughts as we go. Um, yeah, so let me, so here, here we go. So I'm, I'm gonna give a little bit of a, this is the workshop overview for those of you who wanna know what's coming up in the next, Hour, hour and a half. We're going to be talking about our science filmmaking model that we really designed together at Rutgers, um, how to build public trust with your science, how to reinsert yourself into your science, how to uh, use storytelling and film as engagement tools between you and the public. We're going to look at what neuroscience says these days about how to engage with the public through storytelling. Um, we're going to show how scientists can make great film characters we can stop and ask and look about whether your story makes a good story, a good science story. And we're gonna, at the end, go over technical steps that you as scientists can be using to document your work, collection, selection, and reflection. So really the purpose, the purpose of this little mini workshop is to inspire all of you folks to start thinking about how to document your, your science and your scientific journey as you go all the time and to 
keep that media as your data. So we all know that it's urgent and needed to communicate your science, not just to your peers, that's what you have to do, but maybe a little bit in a different way for funders or grants. And then there's a very specific way um, that we know to engage the public and make the public feel comfortable with you and to trust you. So we're gonna go over all of that. Um, we do know that you're all facing a lot of pressures to communicate with the public, and we don't know necessarily how to do that uh, effectively and efficiently in a way that conserves your time, right? But I'm gonna ask all of you, all of you scientists and researchers to begin to see yourself as part of and as leading a science journey because anyone who is a researcher or a scientist is on a journey of scientific inquiry or intellectual inquiry. And then I'm gonna ask you to start imagining that it's necessary to record the authentic science process moments and then to document and treat that media as your science data. And we'll, we're gonna get into all of that in this, in this talk. So of course, we know that scientists, and you know, that you're trained to remove yourself from your research and, and your communication, especially amongst your peers. And of course, that's in pursuit of truth, something that is larger than you in a, a form of objectivity, right? But unfortunately, you know, less than 1% of, of the population knows a research scientist, I'm sorry, or is a research scientist. And so that invisibility allows critics to dehumanize you. And um, of course, right now we're seeing a lot of presentations of scientists as cold and detached in an ivory tower. And it's really interesting that at film shoots, we always are told when we're filming in a lab to use a blue gel. So these, I just did, I did a Google of, um, you know, what is a scientist and they all come up blue. So in case you didn't know this, you're very cold and you're very blue. That's how the public perceives you and seems to want to perceive you, but we can change that. We do know more than ever, there's an urgent need to increase public's trust in science. And as I, as I mentioned, scientists, researchers are a very small percentage of, of the public and most people don't know your language or your process or your training. Science communication efforts have been around for a long time. Um, we do know now in terms of science communication research that the initial model of just giving the public more information is not working. That, that's not the way to engage and connect to the, to the public. The public isn't asking for more facts. What the public wants is to know who you are and to engage with you. And that potential to engage with you is what allows for relationship and understanding and learning. And it's interesting that the, that the, uh, the language, the, the definition of public engagement between science and the public, scientists and the public is really about mutual learning. So I ask you all to think about this not as as a responsibility or an onerous task, but hopefully as a process that will excite you and also provide you with an opportunity to grow and learn. We do know that engagement builds trust. This isn't just between scientists and the public, between any, any individuals, right? The more you know each other, the more you take the time to know each other, that's how, that's how trust builds. And of course, the public is more likely to accept the conclusions, the statements, um, your reasonings, your rationales from people you trust, meaning I don't necessarily have to understand how you do your science and I may never have enough years in my life or time to actually get enough scientific training to understand exactly what you do. But if I like you and I believe you and I trust you, then I'm gonna accept your conclusions. So what we're thinking about, what we're saying is that for public to engage and trust you, they need to see you, which, is, which this means you're gonna need to think about or I'm asking you to think about reinserting yourself into your science. And in this way, we humanize your science for the public. The method that we're gonna share right now is a method that uh, is based on our, our years of experience producing science films here at Rutgers that reached a really wide audience. These are just uh, six of them. I'm gonna kind of go over more. And the reason, and I'm gonna do it quickly, but what I wanna share with you is that this model that we, um, we evolved and I wanna shout out to Oscar Schofield if he's online, cause he was a big person in helping to design this model um, that we know it's a transferable model. It, it's across disciplines, not just 
not just lab science, not just marine science. Uh, it, it goes into uh, any 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 discipline, and we were able to reach large audiences. Um, just to give a quick history of this model here at Rutgers, it did start in 2008 when um, I had the honor of working with my students at the invitation of uh, Rick Ludicher, uh, Oscar Schofield, Scott Glenn, Bob Goodman, to begin documenting um, the marine scientists at, at Rutgers. And we filmed them for a year and a half, um, and we got more than 300 hours of footage. This, this is verite filmmaking style. And that, that film uh, reached lots of audiences and it actually won an award at the Chicago Film Festival. These are, these are my wonderful students uh, down below. Um, that film, Atlantic Crossing, reached a potential audience of 180 million people, broadcast more than 300 times on PBS stations around the country. And this film, Atlantic Crossing, if I may, it was, it was we, we filmed it and we did all the editing in the Rutgers English department. So shout out to Carolyn Williams uh, and Writer's House. That film that we made um, was featured in the Smithsonian exhibit. Um, that featured the Rutgers, uh, Rutgers Historic Science Mission. And the curators at the Smithsonian um, shared with me when we were working on this exhibit that had it not been for a film that featured the robot as a character on an adventure journey, uh, that, that the Smithsonian and the curators would not have had the material in order to make this exhibit. So that was pretty special that this exhibit was uh, up for, I believe it was two or three years. Oscar can correct me on that. And here's Dr. Scott Glenn, who was the featured scientist in that story, presenting him his science at the Smithsonian. Um, there is, you know, there is our down in the lower left, there's a, an excerpt par as part of the exhibit of, uh, of the movie. And there's our, our film, film students, Lizette, Chantal, and Pilar. And still working in the English department, we then partnered with the Rutgers School of Engineering. And this is thanks to Matt Matsuda and Thomas Papa Thomas and Rick Ludicher. We had the support to send Steve Holloway and Chantal Aeong to Thailand to film these engineering students designing a water purification system in the remote villages of Thailand. This was also aired on PBS and it was nominated for a local Emmy Award, which was really, really special. Um, after Thailand Untapped, we were contacted by NOAA and asked to put together a three-part documentary series about, uh, about the changing ocean, and it also won an international award. Um, and then we started working with Mason Gross. Uh, this is a shout out to Julia Ritter. This is the Mason Gross Dance Department, Conrad Herwig and the Mason Gross Jazz, Jazz Trombones. And then we worked with the School of Public Planning, Blaustein School, to make a film uh, about urban gardens. Um, our biggest project was uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in part, along with the, the, the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. This was a grant that uh, Oscar Schofield led, and I had the honor of accompanying the scientists uh, to Antarctica and then returning to Rutgers with, at this point, more than 400 hours of footage. And we were able to engage uh, 14 students in this, uh, in this filmmaking process, and it did get a tremendous amount of recognition. And it was uh, screened on Netflix, um, not screened, available on Netflix for three years. Uh, Antarctic Edge, uh, we like to say Jersey Roots Global Reach, two the theatrical releases on the East and West Coast. And it was even uh, uh, in film festivals here, you see it in, up in the upper, upper left there in Monaco. And these were some of the awards that Antarctic Edge won, including, including a number of, of best science film awards. Uh, the National Science Foundation uh, was excited about this project also because of its engagement of students. The 14 students that worked on this came from all different majors, which was really special, but they learned a lot about climate science. Um, Antarctic Edge was also uh, presented by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, with the chief scientist. Uh, and you can see Dr. Zdenko Willis as well. And again, shout out to Bob Goodman and, and Rick Ludicher who were really leading and have always led this model. So thank you so much. Um, again, this just it, it showing the transferability of this model that uh, as, as Jim had mentioned before, John Paul Isaac's student went with him to uh, Zambia as far as part of his USAID work and made a beautiful film that was featured on the USAID website. 
Um, we made a film funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with IFNH that was following families that were struggling with childhood obesity. Um, and that Generation at Risk film was gaining a fair amount of attention just here locally in New Jersey with interviews on PBS and in the New Jersey Monthly. We also uh, had a project for two years following seven veterans um, who'd returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. This was a tremendously meaningful project. Um, shout out to Scott Hakeem and Steve Abel. It was a really a beautiful experience. We learned a lot. The making of Princess of Piombino. We filmed twice in Rome and it was student directed and student shot and student edited, engaging in other bodies and knowledge and learning through, through filmmaking. So this is really where that interdisciplinarity, that intersection between filmmaking and learning and storytelling and authorship, when you give um, young people recognition and respect and, and voice that they work harder and they learn more, of course. And then I believe this is the last one I'm sharing with you. This was funded by the National Science Foundation, Dr. Anne-Marie Carlton. Uh, and it was um, her work, Atmospheric Chemistry Field Study, enormous project. I'll show you a clip from it. And it was featured on the EPA website. So that shows that our model, uh, we have a lot of information about why that model worked. We're now writing a paper. Uh, we're in the final draft of an academic paper, myself and, and four of our science colleagues, about this model and its, um, and its effectiveness. It is uh, Cinema Verite style, which I'm going to be sharing a little bit more with you, but it really is about following characters over time. And that's important because I'm going to ask you as scientists to start thinking of yourselves as real world characters in real world science stories and imagine those authentic moments in which you have questions or challenges or obstacles or excitement, revelations, you know, um, new discoveries, document them, document them and hold on to them as your media and your science data. And that's really important material that can be used for, for science communication. So this model is a science communication model that transforms your science process into a science and action story. And it's doing a few things. It's intending, it's helping the, the, the community or the public connect to your science and build trust, but it's also helping to communicate your science so that the, the public becomes more informed. And, and that's important as Jim was saying earlier, especially because, because science is informing policy. So we, in our academic paper, we've outlined our model to look a little bit like this. There's the scientific method, there's the dramatic structure, there's the parallel, and we really embed the two. So as you go through your science journey, we can imagine how to shape that into a dramatic structure to reach a larger audience. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through this process of why it's important, you know, why you should document your science pro process and when, what to record, and how to do this. Um, Obviously, there's different ways to build public trust with science, but we're going to begin with the understanding that our brains are pre-wired to accept information in story form. This is something that cognitive scientists know, and we're learning a lot in terms of how we organize our science media, our science stories for the public. We, we're looking to cognitive science of storytelling now. Um, stories change our brains. Um, this is uh, Paul Zach's work has gotten a lot of attention recently uh, using MRIs to look at how brains respond uh, to stories. Um, and then there's the story form, and then you're adding film language on top of that. And, and you've got Yuri Hassan, who's talking about neurocinematics, and he's specifically looking at how they're the audience has these biochemical reactions to certain moments in the film that are dramatic or emotional. And these allow the audience to have greater connection to the characters in the film. I know it's gonna be hard for you scientists and researchers to start thinking of yourselves as characters, but I'm gonna ask you to make that leap. And I'm hoping at the end of this uh, presentation, it makes sense to you. Um, so again, cognitive scientists are talking about character engagement when we're talking about film language. And it is, again, the process by which the film audience has this vicarious emotional experience with on-screen characters. And it isn't just the fact that it's a camera. It isn't just the fact that it's a two digital moving image on a screen. There is a lot to film language and structure that, that allows for these experiences to happen. 
This is one very simple explanation. Framing and personal space increases identification with on-screen characters. So if if we say this is this is from Antarctic Edge, this is um, oceanographer Debbie Debbie Steinberg. The lower left-hand corner image is what I would see if I'm standing on that the deck of that research vessel. That's exactly what I would see from my eye. That that frame. If I were to get much closer to Debbie then I would see that middle frame. But I would have to get uncomfortably close for Debbie, uncomfortably close in order for my eye line to have that frame. I would be about a foot away from her. And she's not inviting me into that space. However, a camera can get into that space. I can be far away and zoom in with my camera and get that frame. And what happens for the, for the audience is that when, when an audience is engaged with an on-screen character who's talking to me, looking right at me, or perhaps it's a, a her point of view and I'm hearing her voice. What happens to me as an audience member is I start feeling that I am her. I start seeing the world through her eyes. And it's a kind of visceral um, identification and connection that we have only in cinema. And this is what cognitive film scientists tell us. So the other thing that we're also being told is that audiences are really seeking to relate to scientists as people. We, we wanna take you off the pedestal. We wanna understand who you are. That's how we're gonna get trust, right? And we're talking about human qualities of integrity, warmth, openness, and vulnerability. Um, and there's a uh, woman named Lise Saffron who's just did an amazing, really, really, I think important study just last year where they gave audiences different, um, uh, different essays by scientists in different configurations. And overall, it was the first person narrative that, again, audience over and over said they related to that person, they trusted that person, they were more willing to listen to that person. That's an important thing to remember. At the same time that I'm asking you to think, to, to imagine why scientists make good main characters in science in action stories. When I say science in action, it doesn't mean you have to go to Antarctica. Your science in action can be that you're downloading a lot of uh, information from satellites and you're creating models of clouds. It's still, science in action just means over time and following you and your processes and your thinking processes and your questions in real time. You make good characters because you have a question. You have a, a question, your hypothesis becomes the dramatic question. And because your question Every scientist's question is bigger than him or herself. That becomes really what a hero is. A hero is in pursuit of something that is bigger than him or her, and that it has value, and that it has meaning that is beyond the individual. That, that allows the scientist in many ways to be always on the hero's journey. So testing a hypothesis, again, becomes that second act. It is the journey to reaching your goal. And the challenges that you face as you're testing your hypothesis become again, within a dramatic structure, those challenges that, that the main character or the hero is facing on his or her journey. So again, within a story, scientists are characters in search of goals that are larger than themselves. That's something I'm, I, I hope you will all remember. Um, now, if you're thinking about how, okay, I get it. I, I need to be more open. I need to be more human. I need to be more of a three-dimensional person to the public. Where do I begin? This is a great way to imagine um, beginning because we do know that across, um, across political sides, Democrat, Republican cultures, religions, across the board, people say that family is giving them the most meaning. And this is a very easy way for you to make yourself more, more complete, more bigger than just a science image, right? Um, a personal backstory that you're willing to share is understood to uh, create this emotional bond between the speaker and the listener when it comes to storytelling. And it's also understood to increase uh, ability and transfer of scientific knowledge. So if you'll bear with me right now, I'm, I have some excerpts of some of the films that we've made, and I'd like to show you some of these examples. So I'm going to, again, we're referencing cognitive science in terms of the emotions that you might feel as you're watching these clips and how those emotions go hand in hand with conveying scientific information. There's gonna be three clips. And then after that, I think there's, uh, I'd like to open up in case anybody had any questions or thoughts. So this is Anne-Marie Carlton's uh, work. 
And this film was made by uh, three students who very bravely went to uh, uh, Alabama on their own. That's Steph Wong, Sean Foyer, and Jamie Deradorian Delia. So we have to set up hundreds of instruments and get this all done within one week so we can take measurements for six weeks. For the National Science Foundation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Electric Power Research Institute, all the organizations that have invested in the campaign this summer is over $20 million. I didn't set out to lead the largest air quality study in my lifetime. Every time we made it a little bit further, it felt like this practical joke that was getting more and more out of hand. Our colleagues are operating a cloud chamber where they introduce particles and expose them to conditions and sometimes form clouds. The tower is a very important component of our suite of measurements that we're making here in Talladega National Forest. And the reason is we need to understand the chemistry at the surface and we need to understand the chemistry that's coming out of the forest canopy. And I want to show the P3 aircraft. Did I go the wrong way? Is it the other side? Yeah. Okay. You have to go on my dad's side, I'm the first person to graduate college. My mom was a teacher. My life growing up is very different than my son's life. They have a very different socioeconomic status. When they were first born, I would worry that I wasn't going to be able to relate to them. You know, uh, they their problems are very like first world problems. And they were born and I just kind of refocused my life and I do things that they like to do. I really care a lot about climate change and air quality. The amount of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere is such that the earth is gonna to continue to warm for some time. You could think of it as if you had a bathtub and it got filled up, you had the, the nozzle turned up full blast, right? And so maybe even if you turn back the nozzle, the bathtub's still very full, right? And when you come up with a solution, maybe you make a little drain in the bottom, but the drain is gonna be like drip, 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 drip. The bathtub's still gonna be full for a long time. If you want to do something about it on a time scale relevant for the people that you love and care about, then it becomes a race. And when it's a race, you need to bring together everyone that you know with their varied talents, their varied instruments, their varied knowledge, their varied models. My mom is a great scientist. Uh, she organized this whole thing. I worry too that if I fail, then it would be like, oh, she was too young or, or she was a woman or um, I don't know, she's from New Jersey. but. It didn't occur to me not to try. It just seems like you put your head down and then you just try. So that that was a student film and it's a, it's actually a 16 minute film and there's a, a beautiful section that's been animated that really goes into the detail of Anne-Marie's science. But the purpose of this clip is to show her vulnerability and her willingness to um, kind of be who she is and, and that type of openness. So. Shout out to, to all of those folks who made that film. I think it's really, really beautiful. Let me see. The, the next film, um, this is from Antarctica. And we're talking about, um, again, how, uh, how stress can help you um, retain information in a funny way. So this is a dramatic scene before the bird scientists are going to Charcot Island where they have to weigh and measure the birds there. Once they get to Charcot, they explain scientifically what they're doing, but there is this anxiety uh, ahead of it. So let me just, uh, this, is, this is the pre-science section. I've been anticipating this since the beginning of the cruise, looking at sea ice images, to try to determine whether we can get anywhere near Shark Cove, let alone actually land on the island. I've never been there before, and neither has Cameron. A little anxious to see what it's going to be like when we get down there. traveled to the Charcot area throughout the night and now it's three in the morning. If we have a window to get in, we're going to go for it. All of our heads are kind of spinning to try to figure out whether this is doable or not. What do you think about heading back out to the station and coming back in and re-evaluating this again? We're going to go back to the station. 
be with wind, maybe the fog will lift, maybe the winds will continue pushing some of this ice out. We'll see what it's like in three hours, four hours. I'm not sure we're going to make it. If it takes three days of trying to do it, that's what we'll do. The challenge here is the area is very poorly charted. Um, in fact, Charcoal Island isn't even in the proper place on the chart. There's a lot of unknowns. You know, we don't know what the ice is going to be like. We don't know if we're going to be able to get you guys ashore for long enough to do your thing. The other uncertainty is if the wind starts to blow, it looks like the back ice is closing in. We've got to bug out of there. Yeah, we're going to keep our group super, super small. If we have to bust out of there, we get to bust out of there. It's about five or six hours later, and uh, conditions have improved. The sea ice looks like it's blown out somewhat, and we can actually see the penguin colony. They need to be attentive, not just to getting in there, getting on the island and doing their work, but they also need to be thinking about the need to be able to get out again at a moment's notice. So that uh, was important for me um, because my challenge when I was in Antarctica was how to connect the science there to the general public. And as I shared, Antarctic Edge won a lot of science filmmaking awards in terms of science content. So we did a good job in terms of the science content in the film. But what I loved um, also in terms of the film reviews is that you'll see them just, all of the film reviews talk about the scientists. These, I'm sorry, these scientists, as you see here, it says these scientists are doing admirable work We've got this film can't help but include the quirky behaviors and personalities of the heroic scientists putting their lives on the line for the sake of humanity. And this is really what made the film successful. It had a lot of science, but science, again, as we know from the deficit model, just communicating the facts to the public is not effective. They have to like the people. And again and again, um, the reviews were that they really liked the scientists. And rather than thinking that these scientists are on a vacation and spending all this taxpayer dollars, they said, wow, they're, they're actually making sacrifices. They're away from their families and they're working 24 seven, they're working so hard. So that was really, we were successful in that way. Um, here's another, is everybody okay with one more clip? Yeah, okay. So here's one more clip again, it's an example of creating suspense before the science, again, at the end of this scene, there it goes into a detailed explanation of how glider robots work. But before that, um, we're nervous about whether it's working or not. Six in the morning, we're all a bit nervous. We're getting ready for this launch. It feels like the whole world is watching. I hope we don't mess up. Everybody set? Captain says it's time to leave. I think everything should go smooth. Very rarely do we have a problem during deployment. The glider mission is scary because we're trying not to be risk adverse. People will remember this for a long time if we can make it. Hope we do. It would be very easy for us to launch the glider in the middle of the night and not tell anyone so that we wouldn't have the chance of failing in public. On the other hand, that's not how science works. We fail all the time. Keep looking for something we forgot. <laughs> I keep looking for something we forgot, but this, this glider looks pretty good. We learn every time we try because the data is coming back into the lab as it's happening. We'll encounter things we don't know, we don't expect, of course. But I think we have the capabilities to handle it. It's actually taken 30 years to get here. It's the culmination of all the work that I've done my whole career, years of my life. Yeah, that's a big moment. Godspeed, are you 27? We'll see you in Spain. I'm waiting for it to dive. And I hope it starts diving soon. Should be diving about now. It hasn't gone down yet. It's still floating. Has he dove yet? No. Something is wrong. 
The glider's not flying right. Did it sink? Or I saw it kind of sink flat. Instead of flying forward, it's flying backwards. Scott, are you afraid? Hell yeah. It could be uh, lightly ballasted. Um, I don't think that's the case. We would have had to forget a part inside of it. It looked like it kind of sank a little flat. We don't want to leave it out like that. Well, we had the whole thing apart yesterday, and it was just us working. What are the chances we forgot a part? Oh, my God. Did we forget a part? Like, did we actually forget a part? <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Tina? Tina, can you hear me? Anybody home? It was a little weird. <laughs> okay. So many of you know this story, but after that moment, after it it, it has an unsuccessful launch, um, we do break into the animation, explain how the glider works. So, so that's at that point you really want it to work, and you're actually interested in in the engineering and the mechanics of it because all these people that you now care about, Scott Glenn in particular, you want this to succeed. Um, so after those uh, those examples um, and some of the ideas we've been talking about, I, I, I'm wondering if if some of you are asking, well, does my science make a good story? And uh, because some people's science again is all data driven, and it and you don't leave um, you don't leave uh, a, a computer room perhaps. Um, but the questions you need to ask yourself is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? You know, what is the a potential? Oh, sorry, what is the potential impact of your work? Uh, why does it matter? Um, it's always good to be thinking about how you can explain your science process, method, and techniques. What is at stake if you do not succeed? That's the big dramatic question. And how hard is your work in terms of time and, and amount of effort? Um, so a lot of people have said to me, of course Antarctic Edge was successful. It was in Antarctica. <laughs> it was this dramatic and exciting environment. Um, it, Antarctica is absolutely uh, a dramatic environment. There, there's no doubt about that. But there have been a lot of films made in Antarctica that have not gotten a lot of recognition. And the challenge that we had when we were there um, was how to connect the average viewer to the science that was going on on that ship. It was science that, in general, they wouldn't understand. Uh, and, and why does it matter? Why spend all this money collecting these water samples in Antarctica? So really, the challenge uh, was was to have the scientists be relatable, likable, and communicate their bigger vision of how they work together as a team to document and communicate this changing ocean system. And I and I do think we were successful there. Um, and then I would say you compare that to the film that we're working on right now, which is here in New Jersey, and it's about basil, right? How different can an Antarctic landscape be to a basil plant? Well, we have a different entry into this story, right? Because basil grows very, very slowly. We start with this story with the farmers. This is John Vanini, Vanini's uh, farm in Vineland, New Jersey. It's a family farm and they are struggling and they're very uh, warm, open people and they're willing to talk about the challenges that farmers face. When they lost their basil crop because of a disease, uh, it had a huge impact on their, their family, on their economy, on their clients. And, and that's where we begin. They have a problem, they need to survive, and then the scientists become the heroes who are taking the very detailed and slow and painstaking steps that can last for years to design a new variety of basil that is disease resistant, that still has all the features that can be marketable for a commercial farmer. So it just shows there's a different entry point. Stories can begin with the people who most benefit from your science. That can be a very dramatic entry point for those of you who say, I don't really want to be the main character in a story. And that's fine. There's lots of ways to think about telling, telling your story. And um, I'm going to show now a little clip, if I may, uh, that, that took place in, in Zambia from uh, the film student Jean-Paul Isaac, who was featuring the USAID agriculture project there. <laughs> Africa. Africa. 
maona mama zungu mama bwera mama kumba ti muri na landi kulu kufuni kati mukazi bwira nchito mo mene ni lima oroni bwira kuno ba kundo ya maningi so ine ni lima kuno ba maenda kumunda wanga wanga wa mene wanga munda na kwa mene ina bwira ine pa umwe wanga ina nichi Inangala na mpavu, inangala ote manga da manga kuchita vintu za mene nifuna, ulo ni kuyenda kuchiteni, kutau ni, ni maenda smart, ni mapeta ndalama mungu. Sema nsongwe women, kuna standiza, tuka gulisa vintu za mene kuyima lima mungu. I can also give you another example. Sometimes people's science obviously is, it could be microscopic, it could be we're looking at, at changing, you know, changing glaciers or changing sea ocean sea ice. And this is where animation can really help explain the scale and or the details of your science. In, uh, in, our, in Antarctic Edge, we used a lot of animation to explain some of the more complex processes and also explain how the, the science, uh, science teams work together. Um, so I'm just gonna share this with you real quick. We have a vast area to study, 69,000 square miles. The research from Palmer is limited, as small zodiac boats can only travel a few miles from station. Our long-term study requires that we spend 30 days on a ship, collecting hundreds of thousands of samples along the entire peninsula. Our small group of 22 scientists have only one month to survey an inhospitable Antarctic wilderness, the size of Oklahoma, moving at the speed of a bicycle. There's a lot of animation techniques out there right now um, that can be used to help you communicate your science. Okay, um, I'm gonna step into the different techniques to documenting your science story, things that you can do yourself just with a, a, a smartphone and a $10 little tripod. But I just wanna stop, does anybody have any questions before I go there? Dina, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to add some questions, I'll bring them to you later. Okay. Okay, then I'll just keep moving forward. So again, I'm, I really hope that you, you will all start thinking about your science, what you do every day, the thoughts that you have, the questions that you have, the concerns that you have as important. Much of this just probably you keep to yourself. You might not even write down some of the, the specific concerns that you have, but, but they do lead to um, a dramatic story and they are your processes. So the first step is to really begin to see yourself uh, within a scientific story, that your scientific process is a story and you are the driver of that story. And then to begin to collect your authentic story elements. Um, remember what uh, cognitive scientist Lee's uh, Saffron said, it's authenticity that they're finding when they do these big surveys with thousands of people, that the public is, is connecting and accepting information from people that they determine or they define as authentic. And that means relatable, that means open, that means uh, inviting inviting us into their lives, not, not hiding your science, letting us see your process. Again, the stories that we do are about process. It's the scientific process, not the final facts. It's allowing us to be able to make um, decisions or decisions about what you do by seeing it and experiencing it with you rather than you just telling us. And this is what you can capture. You can capture these moments. Using a smartphone, you can record your science process over time. I would encourage you to date and include the location of every photo and audio clip and video clip. If you wind up at three in the morning in the lab and you're looking at your samples and you've been waiting six months to see these samples, looking at them for the first time, this, that would be an exciting moment to record. At the end, you might not like it and might decide that this isn't very meaningful, but just turn that camera on. I, I remember the, the Antarctic scientists were having their samples shipped from Antarctica. That's a moment when you're receiving those, those samples and you're, you're, you're looking at what, you, at what you brought back into the lab. When you do this recording, um, please always choose a quiet location. If you're in your lab and you wanna be recording, you think, oh, I'm doing something really exciting. I wanna just record it to see what it is just in case. For... 
Um, if somebody's playing music in the lab, please ask them to turn it off because if you have to edit your video <laughs> clip, you're gonna hear those cuts in that music. Avoid machine noise if you can. I know a lot of labs are noisy and you can't turn off those machines, but if you can move farther away from some sort of refrigerator or, or um, generator or ventilation system, please do. Uh, take advantage of natural light. This is a mistake people often make as they record themselves backlit and we can't see who they are. These are just very simple things to think about. When you're filming, you know, use a, uh, a horizontal frame. That is the filmic frame. Don't, don't use a vertical. These are very simple, simple things to think about. If you're shooting a scene or if you're working in a team and you're filming your colleague, consider coverage. Often people come back and say, I got great, great footage of my, my field work in wherever, and everything is this one wide shot and it's not editable. So think about wide, medium, and close-up so that you have that variation. Consider framing to enhance engagement. Remember what we talked about before when you're filming within that personal space or that point of view of the scientist. That allows us, the audience, to feel that we're seeing the world from the scientist's point of view. So this is not just a point of view shot. It's also what's called an over-the-shoulder shot, right? Um, there is the rule of thirds framing. So Oscar, I'm, I'm putting you in the, in, the, in the hero, action hero realm here, but we tend to find, find images that are framed where our eyeline is going to either the right or left third of the frame as more dynamic, especially if say in an interview, you see that Oscar is not looking directly at the camera, he's looking camera right. Now, if you're gonna be filming your process and you wanna just start talking to the camera, which again, I really encourage you to do. And I, 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 don't want, I don't want folks to get tripped up about, am I doing this right? What's more important is that when you record yourself that it's an authentic moment, that you're excited, you may decide not to use the video and just the excitement of the audio. But if, if you are thinking about ways to do it, again, make sure that you're well lit. I find it more engaging when scientists look directly at the camera and talk to me. I feel like you're communicating to me. Some people prefer to look off camera like you see on the lower, on the lower right there. Um, if you wanna know a little, you know, little bit of film logic, there's the 180 degree rule. So if you had two scientists speaking together, imagine that your floor, wherever space you are is a stage. This 180 rule actually came from the, the famous uh, filmmaker D.W. Griffith from the 1920s, who was the first person to start using close-ups. Um, previously, it was thought that if you were to use a, take a close-up of someone and put it into a film that the audience would think it's a decapitated head flying across the room. But, but it was understood that if you stay within the 180, which is the half of the circle that is of the audience and the other half being the stage, then you've got room for movement. So you see this this camera right here in the center is getting this two shot. This camera that's to the, to the left is getting, is getting this close up and you see they're using the, the rule of thirds and this camera on the right is getting this close up also using the rule of thirds. And then you can edit these together. Um, whenever you're filming, uh, maybe you'll be following somebody around, maybe you're getting lots of close ups of your lab work or your computer or your notes. Remember, ask yourself, did I get an establishing shot? Is the, my audience gonna know our location? If you haven't got an establishing shot, make sure to get one, hold it steady and hold it for 30 seconds. These are just some really, really simple rules. Time-lapse is a really fun way to, again, show your amount of effort. This is about scale. It's about letting the audience know that you work hard. And Laura Brang Brangisi just did this yesterday from the plant biology lab. So this is, uh, they're planting the seeds, the basil seeds. And they're going to have to wait a month, right, for these to grow. So here we did the time lapse every two seconds because it involves people. Starting next week, we're going to put the GoPro in this greenhouse, and we're going to set we're going to set that that time lapse for once every minute because it's plants growing, and it's going to need to be there for a month. Step three is keep a science media database and maintain control of your media. I can't. I can't emphasize this enough. I, I, I know too many stories of scientists partnering with science communicators or filmmakers, and the filmmakers come and 
get all this footage of your science over a long period of time and then they hoard it and they don't give it to you because they say, well, we're not done with your story. So that's not the right type of partnership. This, this documentation of your science is your data. And I know so many scientists who reference that data of their process for, for research purposes, right? We, I know the oceanographers were looking at uh, how the glider dives in different conditions, looking at different sea ice conditions in Antarctica, outlining your story arc based on the most impactful moments of your science journey. This is something after you've documented all your science, uh, you're gonna stop and create an outline and then you can start shaping it into a story. If you've got hundreds of hours of footage or you feel overwhelmed or you don't have enough time to do this, then you can engage somebody to help you. But once you've outlined it, you can go and, and again, string your footage together. Lots of people now know how to do video editing even on your phone. But you can uh, engage with a science communi communicator to help you go over your footage, help you structure it into a dramatic story. Um, I would always encourage you to establish respectful and long-term rules of engagement with anyone that you partner with in terms of a, a science communication story. Look for people that have experience communicating science and are committed to telling your story, that they're not charging you by the hour because science takes a really, really long time. Find a partnership in which both sides are benefiting. Um, I would ask you to respectfully assure creative credit to the collaborator who is perhaps your science storyteller or writer or filmmaker, but always maintain control of your science media because it is your data. Um, this is something I like to think about. Um, of course, there's a lot of components to a science in action story, but in terms of science information, this is one way to think about it, right? You can have moments that are, uh, and it doesn't have to be in this order, but there's different times when the scientists might be laughing or have, have um, made a mistake and are trying to fix it or they're stressed or they're anticipating or, or they're telling their backstory and you're emphasizing. All of those moments should precede an opportunity to provide science information to the public because of course, as we know from cognitive uh, scientists now, neuroscientists, these chemical responses from storytelling increase our attention and retention of science information. Um, lastly, even if you have a fantastic story made, it doesn't necessarily mean anybody's going to see it. And I've also heard too many stories of scientists spending lots and lots of money, perhaps from their grants, to have a fantastic story made that maybe only, you know, a couple thousand people are seeing on a website when really what you want is millions of people to see it, right? That's how you have impact. If you have a great story told and nobody sees it, then you're just not getting that impact. So consider your distribution platforms, whether they're short or long form distribution platforms, social media, obviously Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those, uh, which websites, some of the films I shared with you today were on the USAID and EPA websites. Um, for Antarctic Edge, we had a professional distribution partnership with First Run Features and that did allow us to get Antarctic Edge in theaters in, uh, in New York and Los Angeles and also, and also on, on Netflix. Um, so just to conclude, um, I think what we've learned over these years with this model is that um, your scientific process, whatever it is, can be shaped into a dramatic story for a public audience. Um, I think you should feel that the public wants to connect to scientists as relatable people. Uh, you do have the tools to document really authentic moments of your scientific process and then hold that as your data and, and as your storytelling elements. If you have a smartphone, you have the tools. Remember please that your science media is your data. So collect it and protect it. It is yours. Don't ever let anyone else control it. Um, communicate your science process to your peers, funders and the public to both support your work and to earn public trust. Um, I'm gonna open this up if anyone has any questions or a science story they wish to discuss. If anyone is sharing their science with the public, we'd love to hear about it. Um, so those types of questions, I'd love to open this up for discussion. But lastly, I, I want to, I, I need to leave on the screen the, the special thanks and acknowledgements to all the people that have helped over these last 10 years. And I'm sure I'm missing some people because it's been a number of projects. So if, if you're not on here, 
I apologize, but uh, I, I really am trying to remember everybody. It's been a, a huge collaborative effort over a number of more than five schools at, at Rutgers. Thank you very much.